Hey at Push students, in today's video we'll discuss how to write a great document based question or the DBQ for short. Let's get down to the absolute basics of this essay. So the DBQ um, is the third thing you do on the APUSH exam. It is 60 minutes long to write this essay. You do get a 15 minute reading period for the documents that you get for this essay, which is great. It is 25% of your overall score, so that is important to note. Um, you want to do a great, great job on this particular essay since it's a fourth of your overall score. You'll receive one prompt to write about. You'll be given seven documents. Uh, that give various perspectives on historical development or process. You'll be asked to develop and support an argument based on these documents and other evidence from your own knowledge. And then the topic of the document-based question will include historical developments or processes between the years of 1754, that's the beginning of the French Indian War, and then 1980. So an example outline of a DBQ, you always want to start with an introduction that includes three sentences of contextualization and a thesis statement. Your essay, you do want to include three body paragraphs, beginning with a topic sentence, sprinkling in some specific factual information, SF5 for short, with some key terms. You do want to provide an interpretive commentary. Go beyond just showing what something is. Show why it's significant. What did it amount to? What did it lead to? Build a bridge and show a, the larger significance of whatever evidence that you do use in your essay. And then, and you, if you have time to get to a conclusion, that's great, but a conclusion is not necessary. It is a great place to attempt your thesis statement again. If you feel like you didn't get credit for it the first time around, here's your second chance. The College Board says that you can get credit for a thesis statement if it's in the intro or in a conclusion, so just keep that in mind. It is crucial that you understand the seven-point DBQ rubric so that you can, make, you can score as high as possible on this essay. So let's begin with this. The contextualization in a DBQ is exactly the same as it would be in an LEQ, as we've, as we've seen in class. So what is contextualization? It describes the broader historical context relevant to the prompt. And in, in short, it's background info. Um, it's best placed in the introduction, but you really can put contextualization anywhere in the essay. But you want to knock this point out first, so try and put it in the introduction if you can. Contextualization, as I teach my students, should be the first three sentences in your introduction. Think about the time period that occurred before the time, uh, the, before the prompt itself. So around 25 to 50 years into the past. So if we're talking about the decade of the 1920s, uh, it's irrelevant to be talking about Christopher Columbus or something that happened 100 years, uh, maybe let's say like 1820. Um, if you're talking about the decade of the 1920s. So you want to make it sure that it's relevant. I go about 25, 50 years into the past. Then next, uh, write three sentences with specific background information that lead the reader into the topic of the prompt. In other words, you're setting the stage for the big show, which of course is your essay. So think about the opening crawl lines to these Star Wars films. They do a great job of providing contextualization. They give you just enough background information that you kind of know why people are shooting lasers at each other in those movies. And so you're kind of brought into the film, but you don't know what the plot of the film is. Otherwise, there'd be no point to see the film in the first place. So an example of contextualization, I have one for you in the right over there talking about the Great Depression. So this, uh, let's say we have a sample essay. The sample prompt is want you to write about the Great Depression. So in the years leading up to the Great Depression, America found itself in an extravagant decade of the 20s. It was a time of laissez-faire economics. It was led by the business class leadership. Speculation on the stock market market was at an all-time high, banks made risky loans, and many Americans lived outside of their means by purchasing too many products on credit. And so what I'm doing right there is I'm leading up to the Great Depression, and so my thesis statement will then talk about that, but that is all background information. It is relevant to the prompt. I'm setting the stage for the Great Depression. So consider starting your essay with these phrases. In the years leading up to the Great Depression. That's the, the topic of the prompt, and you see that above. And then also coming out of the previous era, coming out of the decade of the 1920s, America found itself. And then you can kind of start setting the stage for the big show. Contextualization, to me, it's the easiest point um, of the seven in a DBQ. It's, exact, uh, it's the exact same point that you would get in an LEQ. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. The thesis statement is also the same as you would see in the LEQ as well. Your thesis statement has to respond to the prompt. In other words, be on topic. It has to have a historically defensible claim. Um, 
in other words, make an argument. Even a very weak argument can get credit, so just keep that in mind. Uh, just look over whatever you're writing in. Think to yourself, is this really making a point? Is this really taking a stand and making an argument? Establish a line of reasoning. Does, your, does it make sense in general? If you read it and you're still kind of scratching your head, hmm, I'm not sure, maybe rethink that uh, if it doesn't make too much sense. Number four, it needs to be in one place. Um, located in either introduction or the conclusion. The College Board also says that it can be one or more sentences, and so that's also important to note. So if you're taking a little time, taking a little while to go in and make your main point, that's going to be okay because it can be one or more sentences. So a thesis statement can't restate or rephrase the prompt. That is a very common thing that I've seen with students. They'll take the prompt and they basically just rewrite the prompt back and, and you want to avoid that. You want to take a stand. So communicate to your reader that one topic is more significant than two other topics or vice versa. It is your special argument. I have an example for you over here talking about the causes of the American Revolution. So maybe take a moment, pause the video and skim that and you can kind of see where I've got three topics but I'm going to indicate that uh, two of them are more important than one. And so in my class, I've taught my students how to write um, a thesis statement using a thesis formula. Although X, Y because of A and B. And so X is your counterpoint, Y is your main argument, A and B would be your main topics. And, and take a look at the sample thesis that I have provided for you up in the top right corner over there. Can you see how I've kind of plugged that in? Um, I would encourage you to think of uh, your essay as being formatted in this sense. X will be a body paragraph, A and B will be two body paragraphs. All in all, you got a three body paragraph essay. That's kind of a good format to go with on this. So make sure that you get the thesis statement. That's also um, a very important point. Let's talk about document usage here for a little bit. And so we're talking about four points here. Uh, the bulk of your points on a DBQ will come from document usage. So you need to do something with the documents that you're given. You're going to be given seven all in all. So how do I get these points? Let's talk about the, one of the first points here, first and foremost. You must accurately describe the content of at least three documents to address the topic of the prompt. Quotes are insufficient to earn this point. You cannot quote any documents or use opinions in an APUSH essay. Avoid those. But you do get a point if you describe accurately the content of at least three documents. And so you're given seven of these. I think that's a very doable point, actually. And so when you use a document, um, you want to also make sure that your document is supporting an argument. So you must support an argument in response to the prompt using at least six of the documents. Here's where your clincher sentences come into play. Um, therefore, comma, dot, 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 you want to go in and use your evidence, tie if it's SFI or a document, you want to make sure that it's going in supporting whatever your argument is. It's not just kind of randomly floated out there and being used without being connected to some sort of an argument. So these documents should meet and exceed the standard set for the description point itself. And then another way that you can earn another point is for at least three documents you explain how or why the document's point of view, purpose, historical context, or odd and or audience is relevant to an argument. This is hippo. We've done this since 10th grade, and we've done this for uh, a long time now. So if you are hippoing a document, at least three of them all in all, then that's another way of getting a, a, um, a third point right here for document usage itself. And then um, number four right here, uh, another way that you can go in and earn a point with these documents is if you use at least one additional piece of specific historical evidence beyond those that are already found in the documents and relevant to an argument about the prompt, then you can get this extra point. So the response must describe the evidence and must use more than a phrase of reference. This additional piece of evidence must be different from the evidence used to earn the point for contextualization. So let me reiterate this one more time. So you're given these seven documents here, and um, if you use a key term or a piece of evidence that's already mentioned in one of those seven documents, you don't get credit for that fourth point right there. But if you bring in another piece of outside information or evidence that is supportive of that document that's not already mentioned there, then yes, you can get that, that point as well. So to me, that is also very doable. 
um, and it is a, it's a reward for you actually thinking outside the box. So definitely strive to get that point. I think that's very doable as well. So how do I cite a document in a push? Citing a document. So number one, my, my first suggestion is to make it look like this in parentheses doc three. You always want to cite a document just once. I like to use the phrase one and done as far as a document goes. So um, cite a document at the end of a sentence, not in the middle, not in the beginning, but at the end, and cite a document once you're completely finished writing about it in your essay. I'm done with it. I have nothing more to say about this document. I'm moving on to the next one. I want to cite it at the end of the sentence, doc two, period. And then finally, consider using this phrase. When you introduce a document, it's sometimes important to just go in and use the phrase, this is significant because. This is significant because. Why am I urging you to do this? Because sometimes students can describe a document and they start off describing it in that first sentence. And then they make their way in their second sentence when they're talking about a document and then they start to write, this is significant because. The reason why they use that phrase is because it helps them build that bridge to the broader significance where they're going beyond simple descriptions and they're showing the overall significance of the document rather than just simply what it is. So that helps them, especially getting that third point that you're seeing right here on the screen when it comes to hippo, um, all in all. So let's continue um, our how to earn the rest of the points on the DBQ, but I'm hoping that you're seeing right here, uh, the heartbeat of the DBQ is the doc analysis here. So you wanna make sure you're saying something about the, each and every document if you can and that you're using as many of them as possible. So an example of a DBQ here. So I'm not gonna read all this. Um, I want you to pause the video and skim read this here, but notice what I've done here. I've gone in and I've highlighted and read a topic sentence. What I've done is I've gone in and I've underlined key terms, SFI, and then what I've also done is I've tried to go in and where it says in blue, I'm showing you where this student went in and used uh, HIPPO. So they're hippoing a document. So skim read this, and I'm gonna share some more things with you about this. Okay, so what we're seeing right here is document one. And you can go backwards if you want and look at the entire paragraph, but I want you to see how this person used document one, this quote from Thomas Jefferson, in this body paragraph. So you can see they, they kind of bring in this idea of the Missouri Compromise, the background. They gave a little bit about the description of the Missouri Compromise, the 3630 parallel. They kind of gave me the what. And then what they did is they went in and they started to show me the broader significance of it, where they bring in Hippo actually, point of view, where Jefferson viewed that uh, the, he viewed the Missouri Compromise is a future problem that could divide, divide the nation. Notice where this person cited their document at the end of the sentence, doc one, period. They are one and done and finished with it. And so using hippo, uh, historical context, outside information, the author's point of view, they were all mentioned in, that, in, those, uh, in those handful of sentences as you're seeing right there. So that's really good, well done. Document three, this person also cited document three in that body paragraph, and you can see it's a poster from 1859 advertising Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published in 1853. So again, skim read the example right here, and you can kind of see um, this person provides some background that kind of lead up to the publication of um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Notice that Harriet Beecher Stowe's name is not anywhere in the picture, so that could be used as outside information. And so you're seeing also where they go in and eventually they get to the point where they're using HIPPO. It was written to persuade Americans to join the abolitionist cause, and then they cited the document. So consider that, that's a good way. And so they used HIPPO because they used historical context, they gave the background, and they also mentioned the author's purpose in that particular document. Very well done. Another example, again, for, for our purposes in this video, I'm not going to read this to you. Um, I want you to maybe skim read this, but also consider, you know, where do they cite their documents? Do you see uh, in particular where it's highlighted in blue right there? There's that famous phrase, this is significant because, and what they're doing is they're building a bridge right there to show the overall significance of the document or the evidence that they're using. In this case, it is the Dred Scott v. Sanford case that they're talking about.
Okay, so let's finish this out by looking at a few other things here with this particular essay. This is document four. It was cited in that body paragraph that you just saw in the previous slide. And so you can see right here, they've gone in, they've taken a document, it's an excerpt from the Dred Scott Supreme Court decision. They've cited it at the end of the sentence. You can see that famous phrase that I mentioned earlier, this is significant because, and so this is a good example of using HIPPO. You see historical context and outside information um, that was all used in this particular one. Again, it's a great example of how to go in and just kind of use these documents. And essentially what you're trying to do with all of these documents that we've been studying is um, you're trying to make them kind of almost like talk and interact with each other. You group them together, which ones work well with each other, which ones don't work well with each other. And uh, you're trying to kind of almost like make them talk and interact with each other. Um, you have to go back a couple slides, but if you do, you'll see document five that was used. Um, in that body paragraph, and you see it's a map, it's a political map. You can see it's an election uh, of 1860, and you can kind of see the data that's all a part of it. And so this person right here, uh, they did a great job, again, of using HIPPO, so skim read over there to the right how they use document five in a body paragraph. And you can see that they use the context. You have outside information with Fort Sumter and the idea of secession, um, and Abraham Lincoln that's being, um, and his uh, rise to power and rise into the political fame and uh, all that stuff is analyzed and so they did a fantastic job with that as well using that document in a body paragraph. Okay so the final point that you can get on a DBQ the seventh point is the most elusive one and it's never easy to explain how to get a complex understanding point whether it be an LEQ or a DBQ but a complexity point, you get this when if you demonstrate a deeper understanding of the prompt, you should include a counter argument through your essay. That's why I have you writing the although X part. And while I'm thinking about it, if that's really hard and confusing for you, why don't you, in a thesis statement, why don't you just lop off the although X and then just make your argument Y because of A and B. That can still get a thesis point, but the reason I have you going in and writing although X and doing the counterpoint is I'm trying to help you actually earn a complexity point. So if you give the other side of the story, that helps. This is the purpose of that X or the counterpoint in a thesis statement. I suggest writing one body paragraph that addresses the other side of the argument in your essay. So for an example, um, in an essay about the differences between two topics, I would be sure to spend at least one paragraph writing about how two topics were similar. But don't stress too much about this point. It is an incredibly difficult point to earn. However, what I've found is that students that usually strive to earn the complexity point usually go on to write very, very strong essays all in all. So don't stress too much about the complexity point. Instead, worry about these right here. Get the gimme points. These are the ones that I feel like are pretty doable actually in this essay. So contextualization, the background info in the intro, first three sentences, uh, start off with that one. Get a thesis statement point. You know, even if it's a weak argument, uh, it, you'll get credit. Uh, you could ac accurately describe three of those seven documents within your essay. I think that's also very, very doable accurately describe three of them, cite them, get that point as well. Outside information, all you have to do is bring in one piece of outside evidence. The only rule is it just that evidence can't already be mentioned within one of those seven documents. So right there, you do those four things, like you're already half credit on a, uh, on a DBQ, and that's uh, very attainable, it's very doable. And then finally, I also believe it's pretty easy to hippo at least three documents. And so a four or a five on a DBQ is actually pretty solid. That's not too bad all in all. You'll, I think you'll find there's a lot of students uh, worldwide that are gonna have a hard time scoring a four or a five on a DBQ. Um, but hopefully as we round out this video, you'll know what you need to do to get uh, all uh, seven points if you, if you possibly can. So all in all, I hope that this video was helpful. Um, if you have anything that you need or if you have any questions, please be sure to get in contact with me. Um, thank you so much for, wa for watching this video and best of luck in the future.